This is the Battle of Pharsalus, which took place in 48 BC. Between Pompey the Great and Julius Caesar. According to Hans Delbruck in his book, The History of the Art of War, Volume 1. Now, the reason I say that it's according to Hans Delbruck is because Caesar, in his Civil Wars, writes about this battle. But his forced estimates are quite different from the forced estimates that I've read about in this book and that I happen to agree with. Caesar claims that he had 22,000 men total. And he only had 1,000 cavalry and he had the rest in infantry against 47,000 total Pompeian forces. So 40,000 infantry were opposing him and 7,000 cavalry. That seems to be preposterous. That seems to be a total overestimation, especially in light of what happened. 7,000 cavalry against 1,000. It just doesn't make sense. After I show you the course of the events, you'll understand why. Um, Caesar is notorious for overestimating his opponent's strength and underestimating his own. Why would he do that? Well, there's always the idea of the underdog, and Caesar wanted to paint himself as the underdog, overcoming great odds, uh, having fortune on his side, the god, as it were, the god of fortune, battles. Uh, Caesar is not writing in order to accurately portray an historical event or to allow us to conduct military science or our study of strategy. Caesar is writing for political reasons, personal political reasons, and uh, that's why he almost always says that he's outnumbered. According to Delbrook in another, in another video, which I may do later, we, he talks about um, how Caesar probably, probably never fought without having numerical superiority, except possibly for this battle, in which he claims that Caesar has approximately 30,000 men total, and Pompey has approximately 40,000 men and that in cavalry strengths, it's probably about 2,000 men to uh, 3,000 men. So let's, let's assume that each one of these units is about 500 men uh, for cavalry purposes. For infantry purposes, let's say, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,000 or so. Just for, this is not accurate in those terms. This is just give you a relative idea of the strengths involved. So Pompey certainly had more infantry and, and, and more cavalry. The thing is, though, these are Caesar's legions, okay? These are Caesar's seasoned veterans. They were bloodied. They were uh, his veterans from the wars in, in Gaul. He has um, Germanic cavalry that have been with him for a very long time. And uh, they have recently just fought a skirmish against some of Pompey's forces using combined arms technique tactics that we will discuss, where the cavalry, the heavy infantry, and the light infantry, which I'm using to represent light in infantry with these uh, units here, uh, in combination. And they did that just, just a few weeks before this battle takes place. Uh, we believe in August 9th of uh, 48 BC, but uh, ca uh, calendar number or calendar dates in those uh, times can be a little complicated. Um, that's a subject for another video as well. Wow, I'm getting a lot of ideas. So anyway, um, let's get to the battle. So Pompey has a larger force of, inf of infantry. His legions, though, are probably a third Roman citizens and two-thirds uh, levies that he's um, uh, replenished his losses with in Greece. So he has allies mixed in with his forces. Caesar has... Uh, seasoned veterans that have worked together before and uh, very effectively, um, but he has less infantry. Uh, there is a river along Pompey's right flank, Caesar's left flank. As a result of this, the normal way to set up 
uh, legionary army is the infantry in the middle and cavalry on both sides. But because Pompey knows that his flank is taken care of by the river, his right flank, he's moved almost all of his uh, cavalry in, into the, um, to the left flank. And he intends to use that as his striking blow, his first blow. What he's going to do, his strategic plan is to, is to ride down here with his light infantry as well, soften up Caesar's cavalry, drive them from the field, and then attack in the flank. That's Pompey's plan. In addition, Pompey is going to withhold his um, infantry from attacking. Normally, they would advance at the same time. Both infantry uh, phalanxes, as they are called, or legions, as they're called um, so, uh, in um, later times, in later Roman times, would meet somewhere in the middle and they would clash. They would come to hand-to-hand um, -hand combat. But Pompey wants to have the 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 full force of his cavalry, which he has numerical superiority of, over, take care of the Caesarian cavalry, drive them from the field, and then attack the flank of the infantry legions while they are being while they're dealing with that. And then Pompey will advance and take and and uh, and attack on two uh, on two fronts. The reason for that is because uh, Pompey wants the situation to develop so that um, if Caesar decides that he wants to attack and does the normal thing where he advances uh, his forces, Caesar's forces will not meet his forces halfway and therefore will be forced to um, either break into a run at, at halfway because that seems to be the tendency to come to grips with the opposing cavalry and then, or opposing infantry, and then to be out of breath and that would be a tactical advantage to his infantry or who are holding their ground. Maybe, maybe, and we don't know this from the sources, but it's possible also that Pompey had uh, a favorable uh, geographical advantage since he picks this battlefield. He's got the, the uh, right flank taken care of. He also may have had somewhat of a higher ground and he probably wants to post his infantry on that higher ground so that Caesar is attacking uphill. We don't know that for sure. However, it seems like a possibility. Caesar, in the meantime, can see that he is outnumbered on both, in both infantry and in uh, cavalry. So what Caesar is going to do is he expects that there is going to be a cavalry attack. In order to counter this, and knowing that he has less cavalry, he is going to withhold his cavalry, and in fact have them draw back. And he has set a trap. He has taken his third line, his third line, and he has moved them at an angle, so that when the Pompeian cavalry comes to attack, they will be able to lie in ambush. Now think about this. Unless there is a uh, very, very large... Um, geographical advantage for Pompey. He is not going to be able to see that this setup is like that. He's going to look straight on and not be able to see that the third line has been moved. He doesn't have the benefit of this camera angle and having an aerial view. He can only see things from the ground. So he does not know that that is happening. So Pompey's strategy is not a bad strategy. It really isn't. He has a mixture of forces, possibly even polyglot forces, harder to command, less seasoned, and he wants to await the attack. So it's an offensive-defensive strategy. Caesar has veteran infantry, and he has less cavalry, so he's going to anticipate the cavalry attack, use his veteran infantry to aid him in counteracting that. So that's exactly what happens, is the cavalry advances with the light infantry. And the light infantry are like... Guys throwing javelins, slingers, um, archers, and uh, they're going to try to attack the uh, horsemen on Caesar's uh, right flank. Think about it. If uh, you want to soften the enemy before impact, you probably want to attack them or their horses with um, projectiles. 
uh, distract them or possibly even disable them, spook them, have some of them leave the field. So it makes sense that this is combined attack, and Pompey was good at this as well. Pompey is, is an excellent general. He's no neophyte to this. So um, that's what he's doing, screening with his cavalry the guys who are marching up behind and launching these missiles, presumably overhead or in between files, we don't know the exact formation, into Caesar's cavalry. Caesar has his cavalry withdraw. Pompey's cavalry advances. And that's where the interesting part happens. The trap is sprung. So Caesar's light infantry starts attacking the cavalry. These cavalry wheel about and attack and the heavy infantry attacks in the flank. You can see what's about to happen here. Pompey's cavalry becomes enveloped on two sides and retreats. So when they start withdrawing, Caesar follows up. His infantry moves into position as well, and then there's a general infantry advance up the hill. Now, this infantry, I cannot overstate this, is veteran infantry. Caesar's 10th Legion, which is legendary uh, in the Gallic Wars, is here and present. So they're marching up the hill. Pompey knows what to do in case of the possibility of an envelopment. He's got cavalry coming up the hill. He's got light infantry coming up. He's got heavy infantry following behind them, and he knows, since his cavalry is being driven from the field, that he's going to take it in the flank. So what Pompey tries to do is exactly what Caesar had done prior to the battle, and this is the correct uh, uh, procedure in this case, and he tries to take his third line of um, infantry, presumably, and move them over to form an angle to prevent the envelopment. However, there is a big difference between doing this before the battle as an ambush and doing this on the fly in confusing, loud circumstances while an attack on the front is imminent and an attack on the side is imminent. It's a very different thing. Of course, what happens is this, he is unable to accomplish this. Uh, eventually, he is attacked on both sides. They give way. Pompey actually flees the battle. Uh, there is a defense for that in the History of the Art of War, Volume 1 by Delbrook, saying that the battle was lost, but Pompey's political, uh, let's say, how did he put it? The political um, aspirations of his cause were no longer compatible with the military situation on the ground. The fact that his army was going to lose, but that didn't mean that Pompey had to get caught. So Pompey flees. There's a camp that's besieged, and most of the infantry flees into the hills, where it is surrounded and surrenders um, to Caesar's forces later, uh, and some of, of which are actually incorporated into Caesar's legions after this battle. And Pompey goes on to live another day. So that is the history, or the, um, the unfolding of the Battle of the uh, Pharsalus on August 9th, 48 BC, according to the uh, strengths used by Hans Delbruck in this book. And um, you may see other uh, videos that talk about it uh, with Caesar's strengths. But as you can see, it seems rather incredulous that 7,000 cavalry and 40,000 infantry would not be able to overpower 20,000 or 21,000 infantry and 1,000 cavalry, especially in this uh, scenario and with Pompey as a general, he was a good general. Um, so that's, that's the history behind it. I welcome any thoughts because as uh, Delbrook quotes um, Goethe, Goethe spoke once of the great step forward that one can sometimes experience through a single significant word, and another time he said that one learns best, not from books, but through a, a living exchange of ideas, through contact with wise people. The truth of these pronouncements I learned from myself. And uh, that's what I invite from you. 
If you have something wise to say about this, please um, put it in the comments below. Let's start a dialogue, and uh, I will cover further battles in the future, and I may even talk about this in greater depth, talking about the strategic situation at the time and uh, why Caesar actually fought this battle with less men than uh, in other battles when he had a numerical superiority. I hope you all had uh, fun with this, and I hope this explains something. If you like this video, please give me a thumbs up, and uh, please subscribe. Um, that would help me immensely, and uh, share it if you uh, want to uh, show your friends. Thanks. I'm Pittsburgh Pat.